Good morning, good morning all. Good morning. Welcome on a snowy winter day. Thank you for all coming out and braving the elements. I'm New York City Council Member Andy King, Chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee. I'd like to thank my partner in serving the City of New York, Councilwoman Debbie Rose, who is the Chair of the Youth Services Committee for us coming together to have a conversation about how do we manage runaway youth in the City of New York and how its impact has on the juvenile justice system. I also want to recognize our council member in, in serving our youth in New York, council member Robert Holden is joining us today from Queens as part of the committee, and as well as uh, the, our Josh Kingsley, who was part of our council here to help get things done, and our committee council is? Paul Senegal. Paul Senegal, I like that name, Senegal. Well, the committee wants to recognize the needs for sufficient comprehensive services for youth who run away from home and become homeless. We as a city need not to work only work together to prevent these youth from becoming runaways and homeless, but we also must work adequately to try and care for special population if they become involved in the juvenile justice system. It is also important that we ensure that our youth leaving the juvenile justice system will not for be forced to return to life on the streets, but instead be able to be provided proper discharge services that will unite them with their families and their communities. Today, the community looks to learn how the Division of Youth and Family Justice has made efforts and in innovative initiatives and partnerships with many of our community-based organizations to address the various issues facing New York City runaway and homeless youth. We are looking forward to hearing from advocates, runaway, who run away, excuse me, advocates of runaway youth in order to learn more about relationships between this population and their involvement in the juvenile justice system. The committee further hopes to explore ways ACS and DYCD can work together to reduce the youth homelessness, prevent their involvement in the juvenile justice system. So I want to thank everybody again with that all being said, all everyone who helped put today's conversation together. I want to thank all the council members that are here. We're looking forward to testimony that is real, truthful, and that's going to allow us to understand the system that we're dealing with each and every day because our jobs is to save lives. Regardless of our young people are 13, 14, 15, black, white, whatever color we want to call, claim ourselves, whatever our sexual orientation is, at the end of the day, we and adults in this room made a claim to take a responsibility and vow to a responsibility to help young people who are in crisis, whether their families are in disarray or whether their homes are in disarray, whether it's from drug, drug use or whether it's just can't not be able to deal with a parent or just the societal norms that you're in conflict with, but forces you to leave your home, that you're not protected by society. And then when you come into our system, and I'd hate to say it, our system, but if you are caught in a situation that you need help from the city of New York, what is the city of New York doing real time, real talk, real services, to making sure that that teen that ran away can run back to a home that's stable, that will allow them to be productive adults. So that all being said, we're going to listen to testimony from our administration here. I want to thank you, Mr. Franco, Deputy Commissioner Franco, for being here and the entire team that's here that's going to tell us a little about what ACS is doing as well as the juvenile justice system is doing and making sure that our young people get it right, got it right, and we service them right. However, before we jump into your testimony, I'd like to bring up a young man who has been in the system who's just, who he can give real testimony as well as his story. I'm going to ask you to vacate one of those seats or two of those seats to bring him up one of who just returned back from the Grammy Awards. I'd like to introduce you all to hip hop artist Casanova, who is joining us to tell his story to help our young people and the city of Nook understand what we can do to improve conditions that he had to experience. Thank you, Brother Casanova. Thank you for joining us today in City Hall. Hello, how you doing? Hello, how everybody doing? Um, my name is Caswell Senior. Um, I've been locked up in and out of jail since uh, 13. Um, running away, that's regular, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I've been in solitary confinement 24 months straight. Um, I thought of suicide. I thought of all the things you could imagine. Um, the jail system to me, criminal justice system, I just think it's harsh. And it's, it's worse as a kid than an adult because um, I think when I went to jail as an adult, it was just more calm. Like, as a kid, it's just reckless. 
you don't really got nothing to live for. And um, the COs is, is, is worse than the inmates because, you know, they let you get beat up. They let you get jumped. Um, it was traumatizing. I saw certain friends hang up. Um, and um, I think that we need, all of us need to help people leaving jail. Because when you, when you, like me, I did seven years and a half straight as an adult and coming home, I had nothing. You know, um, I was blessed to be in the studio and, and come up with some words that I didn't even think I could come up with and become a rapper, sign the Jay-Z's label, Rock Nation. But all of my friends wasn't that lucky. Some of them are back in jail, 25 to life. Uh, 50 years, 10 years, but it all started with us being juveniles. Like, it was like a repeated situation. We'll go to jail, come out, go to jail, come out, go to jail, come out. But I think that's because we wasn't getting help in jail. You know what I'm saying? It's like, they don't give you a out when you in there. It's like, you're gonna come back. Don't worry, you're gonna come back. It's not like, let's help you not come back. I think we need programs in jail so you can stay out of jail, you know what I'm saying? They got certain programs in there like ASAT, KSAT, I don't know if y'all understand them. It's like drug programs, anger management programs, but it's not really programs to help you cope with being outside. Like, I didn't even know how to go get my ID. Little stuff that you should know as a man, you, you don't know. I didn't know how to do income taxes. I didn't know anything, so it was like, I was ashamed to even tell a girl, like, I need help going to the DMV. You know what I'm saying? We should have something where they, they get their IDs and stuff like that from in there, their welfare from in there. Like, some people are afraid to go to the welfare office to get their food stamps because they don't want to be joked on because you still, your mental is still like a little kid. Like some people be like, yo, how you having so much fun? You, you 31, you moving like 17. Cause I still feel 17. I've been going so much years, I still feel young. And I just think we need to help from the inside for the outside because it's, it's, it's none of that in there. They don't show you how to do that in there. They, you just working, you just fighting, you just doing the things that criminals do in jail, convicted felons do, you know? But it's nobody, in there telling us how to cope with being outside. And it's, it's mental health issues is, is, is crazy, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I gotta catch myself, like, it's hard coming home and then seeing your daughter that you never saw before and being able to, to father her and you don't even know how to take care of yourself. So it, I just, again, I just think we need to build something like with 90 days of somebody coming home, 100 days, a year even, Come in this program, we're gonna show you how to deal with being a civilian. Not just being in the streets, but being a civilian. I say civilian because, you know, you could come home and just be who you wanna be. I'm talking about coming home, doing the right thing, getting a job, understanding what a pay stub is. My first pay stub, I was like, what, what the, tat, what? Why are they taking this out of my, like, right. you know what I'm saying? So just, <laughs> Something that uh, teach us what's going on in the street. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your humble, sting, humble hum, being humble and, and being honest. Because so many, so many, we come here in council, and I, I'm not going to talk for anybody else, but I, I know I have not lived that life of being incarcerated for eight years. I have not lived the life of being in juvie. I've had to work with young people who are trying to figure themselves out, but he makes a valid point to all of us. While we have programs, and last hearing that we had was to talk about what programs are designed in ACS to prevent recidivism so someone doesn't go back into the system. But you clearly have made, made it laid out that they're not doing a very good job mm -hmm. because you were, for eight years you were in, and then when you came up, no one advised you how do you just go get a regular ID card. Mm -hmm. No one taught you how to be a civilian, but you know the, same, the, the sadness is that this is the population that we say are our future, and we're not helping them out. 
but when, and I love the armed forces, but we, and we do the same thing to our men and women who serve our country. Sometimes we don't treat them well when they come back home to teach them how to go from shooting a gun and being, you know, overly aggressive to how to be calm and manage home again. We as America, we as New Yorkers, we as Bronx, I must do a better job when our people who are in stress when they come back home. I want to thank you for what your experience has been in telling us so we can figure out solutions to get it right. So I've heard from you that one thing we need to fo focus on is making sure that, and I like what he said, Commission, Deputy Commission, I want to say to you, my brother, we need to figure out that six-month plan. What is a six-month engagement plan? I know we do have plans. What is a plan to teach somebody of civility? Because he says, I don't even know how to be a civilian when I come out. I just come out and I'm free. Even though you taught me how to say hi to my mama in the right way, I still don't even know what things in society that I need to focus on. Mm -hmm. If I get a job, why is somebody taking, like, <laughs> counsel was, you taking that much taxes out of me? Why are they taking away? Why, why, you tell me you're going to pay me $100 a week while I'm getting 75 mm -hmm. You know, this is a reality for people who are incarcerated and kids, when they come out, they don't understand that. So we definitely got to do a better job to help you. Know. Yes. And I think some people are scared to ask for help especially grown men, because even me, I was scared to ask, like, you don't want to ask your, your girlfriend or your mother or somebody that, that, that is supposed to be equal with you, yo, why they took that out of my taxes? Or how do you do that? Or how do you go get your license? It's, you might not think it's hard, but it's hard with being in jail for five years, or I should say, as a juvenile, right. coming home as an adult, mm. it's a big difference. You know, things you had to worry about when mommy and daddy took care of, and what if they didn't take care of it? You had to learn it in jail. Now you, be, you being from a juvenile to adult, you're lost. Any juvenile, anybody that gets locked up at 17 or 18 and comes home 26 is lost. You need more than God. <laughs> yeah. You're lost, you know what I'm saying? And that's what happened with me. I was in and out of jail, and then that long, that long 19 to 26 lost me. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed, I always say it, because friends of mine don't, don't, don't get it back like that. Some of them are mentally ill. Some of them just go right back to jail because that's where they're comfortable at. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like paying rent. You know, some people don't like, <laughs> that's hard. Right. As a, as, as, again, coming home from a juvenile to adult to you gotta pay rent, why I gotta, what? Send me back to where I'm comfortable mm -hmm. at for free. Mm. But anyway, I said that to just help out. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for having we me. We really appreciate your conversation and your testimony thank today. You. Thank, thank you so you much, Council Nova. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask if the administration, if you could just give Councilmember and I five minutes. We'll be right back.
Okay, we are back. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for their patience. Um, I've said to C Deputy Commissioner Franco all the time, and when we started, we need to figure out ways to have conversations with people who really experience the system so we can get a real passionate thought process together because while we sit on the sidelines or read a book or visit a facility every once in a while, if you not spend the night or ate the food or had to engage with the population at a particular place, you really do not know the feelings of what people now, especially our young people. So I want to thank Hip Hop Artist Casanova for giving his life experience to give us an insight of what it is to really be in there and what you can go through as a teen, because we're adults in this room. Imagine being a 14-year-old or 15-year-old in lockup, 16 year old, and then transitioning into adult. You know, I, I've met friends that have gone in lockup and they come out after being in seven years, they still think we're in high school while we're all with family. Their whole world is like, who's so, man, people are gone and people graduated and moved on, you know, but their world stopped when they went in. So, and, I, and, 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 and as I go to swear you all in, the final thing I want to say, the one of the greatest things, he, yes, we, we're going to let councilman, but one of the greatest things he said was that how, what a feeling was for him to be 14 year old to come out and all of a sudden he's dropped with all these responsibilities and not even knowing how to navigate and the system failed him. But he was blessed that someone adopted him to help him to be a messenger today. That's only can give credit to the most high in Christ for all that. So with that all being said, I'd like to turn the microphone over to the great Debbie Rose out of Staten Island, chair of the youth committee. Wow, I got like a Casanova introduction. <laughs> I like that. Um, I, I wanna say good afternoon, cause it is afternoon. Um, and, and I just wanna say ditto to the, um, the very passionate remarks that uh, council member King, you know, made uh, prior to us leaving the, the room and uh, upon our coming back. Um, and, and I wanna thank uh, Casanova for his very prolific remarks. You know, this is a young man who spent his formative years in prison and with no transition to adulthood, no supervised, structured transition to adulthood. And um, I, I think uh, his words should resound in this chamber today um, and make us re-examine what re-entry programs look like for, for young people. With Raise the Age, we have people who are coming into the system who um, are, are young people, are juveniles who are children. And there's no mechanism to help them make that transition from being a child to being an adult and um, I, I hope that the administration um, takes back, you know, what was said today and, and we re-examine what programs look like. So now back to my scripted remarks. Thank you, Council Member King. <laughs> I want to echo your welcoming of everyone in attendance at today's joint oversight hearing on runaway and homeless youth known as RHY and the juvenile justice system. I am Council Member Debbie Rose. I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And I would first like to thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for his commitment to youth of New York City, and specifically his dedication to runaway and homeless youth. I would also like to thank all the young people, especially Casanova, the advocates, program providers, and all those who came to testify today for showing up to this important hearing. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us today because they too know how important our young people are. And they are Council Member Chin, Barron, and Holden. From the onset, I want to admonish anyone who unfairly conflates runaway and homeless youth with crime or concerns about neighborhood security. Runaway and homeless youth are one of the most vulnerable populations within our great city and they are the ones who are so often victimized and who deserve our attention. These young people find themselves on the streets, homeless and without support due to family conflict, lack of affordable housing and poverty. Many youth have experienced unspeakable trauma and abuse. 
which has created additional challenges for them to become stably housed and assimilated into the general population. This includes physical, emotional, sexual abuse, as well as neglect. Things that exacerbate and perpetrate this endless cycle that they are in. A common thread we see time and time again is that runaway homeless youth lack knowledge of where the access services, while at the same time are extremely resourceful in surviving out on the streets, many times relying on their peers, strangers, and others. And I think it's very telling that that's exactly what Casanova um, addressed. Um, they, uh, they engage strangers and others, um, and runaway homeless youth may engage in survival crimes in order to access the kind of necessities we all take for granted, such as food, shelter, and other essentials. And yes, runaway homeless youth may interact with the juvenile justice system as a result of this. However, I would like to state that many runaway and homeless youth do not have a choice in these matters and thus are forced through their incredibly difficult circumstances to survive for even just one night more on the streets. In efforts to diminish the barriers and challenges runaway and homeless youth go through, DYCD provides services and programming for the runaway homeless youth population throughout New York City. Although DYCD, Department of Youth, and community development, does not offer specific programming geared toward runaway homeless youth within the juvenile justice system. DYCD does offer general RHY services and programs, such as street outreach, referral services, drop-in centers, crisis centers, and TILs. That's transitional independent living, yes of which this committee has looked at extensively. In addition, family support, literary services, economic skills building, and workforce development are provided by DYCD for all youth. Notably, DYCD generally focuses on a more holistic model of building skills and providing services that add to the whole individual rather than specifically targeting runaway and homeless youth involved within the juvenile justice system. Specific to this hearing, we will examine the interaction between RHY and the juvenile justice system. As Council Member King discussed, the Department of Youth and Family Justice is responsible for providing detention services for youth throughout the city. Thus, this leads to an interesting yet subtle relationship between DYCD and DYFJ. Division Youth Family Justice. And through this hearing, we would like to learn more about how these agencies interact. I would also like to learn about DYCD's future efforts to ensure that runaway and homeless youth do not touch the juvenile justice system, as well as help runaway and homeless youth re-enter society from detention successfully. I look forward to hearing from those invited to testify and would like to thank my staff and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, and Michelle Peregrin. And um, thank you, Council Member King, again. Thank you, Councilwoman Rose. Appreciate your words of wisdom and encouragement. And I just ask as we listen to your testimony, um, I cannot reiterate the words of Casanova just shared with us why he, early in his life, he joined the gang while he was locked up because the protection from the games, because the family deserted him. So he had to make new friends in jail. And when he made new friends in jail, they cooked together. They sat down and read together. They fed each other together. They looked out for each other. They got money together. All these things became his family inside. And then when he came out, the system didn't lead him on the right path to reunite with strength outside. And then he was lost due to the fact, where was the family? Where was the gang that he connected with? They were just as lost and inside. They all walked outside of that jail without no hope and no, there was no one fed them a path to being a productive human being with love and support outside. I'm hoping today's conversation allows us to recognize that, come up with solutions and free ourselves from old thinking to figure out a new way of thinking to help our young people 
who are runaways, who are in the juvenile justice system, who we need to make sure they don't ever return once we get them on the right track. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you all, if you don't mind, raising your right hand and taking an oath to commit to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, as you share your testimony today. We thank you, and we're looking forward to hearing today's testimony. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we have testimony for the record, and we, we're going to go through it. We actually may try to um, um, kind of skip some sections of it purposely because we want to have a conversation, and I think the way this hearing opened, which was unique and new, I mean, it's something that we should take advantage of. And so on that note, before I read my testimony, I, I want to I wanna say two, two things that we should be, a few things that we should be very proud in New York City. Um, for the first time, after 100 years, New York State finally raised the age. And I think after hearing what we just heard, it's important to remind us that last year, October, October of 2018, 16-year-olds came into the system as juvenile delinquents. Can you hear me? Sure. So I think we should be all very proud that last year, as October of 2018, the 16-year-olds came into the system, finally after 100 years away from the criminal justice system that we just heard about. Um, and this year, October, those 17-year-olds um, that actually used, they're still going to the criminal justice system, will finally be coming into the fold of the juvenile justice system. And that's something that we should be very proud of in New York City. We were actually a significant part of the effort to make that happen in the state of New York. Another thing that actually is important to keep in mind is that New York City is very unique since 2012 because of the enactment of close to home. And while in many, many, many places in the nation, young people are released from placement, usually just with a train ticket or a bus ticket to go back to their city, I mean, Chicago or elsewhere, in New York City, we make the decision and commitment that our youth were our youth and all of those young people are actually in the community in close to home, and all of them leave their placement sites with at least four months of aftercare, where they're supported and they're actually taken care of and connected to services in preparation to be successful in the community. That's something that we should be very proud of since 2012. And then when we think about the juvenile justice system, and it was so eloquent posed by Casanova before, we work really hard with our partners, actually at the YCD, to make sure that our young people in detention get a summer job, get a bank account, and Louis Watts and others can talk about their experience. But I think we should all be proud in the historic moment after 100 years, finally those 16 and 17 year olds are gonna come into the juvenile justice system where they belong. On that note, good afternoon, Chair King, Chair Rose, and members of the Committee of Juvenile Justice and the Committee of Youth Services. And Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice, DYFJ, with the Administration for Children's Services. With me today, Sarah Hemeter, Associate Commissioner for Community-Based Alternatives and Close to Home, Assistant Commissioner Louis Watts for, for Detention, and Randy Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth Division within the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the interventions that we at the Division of Youth and Family Justice and our sister agency and our non-for-profit partners provide to help and strengthen, fa strengthen families and support youth in the community. Youth who have challenging relationships with their families are vulnerable, leaving them at a risk of foster care, homelessness, sexual exploitation, and in some cases, juvenile justice involvement. Much of ACS work across all of our program areas focus on efforts to strengthen family relationships and communication whenever it's safe to do so. We know that for most young people, the best way to provide positive youth outcomes is to support the whole family unit. And we have invested heavily in providing intensive family supports to families and youth to prevent delinquency, truancy, chronic running away, and homelessness. Because we know that supporting families is so important and effective, we are extremely disappointed and concerned that the state executive budget for the fiscal year 2019-2020 proposes to eliminate the ability to keep youth safe by eliminating the capacity to place them in foster care increasing the risk of homelessness and juvenile justice system involvement. 
In addition, the state proposed budget, proposed budget will eliminate all state reimbursement for ACS community-based alternatives that help divert the same youth from foster care and help, helping them and their families stay together. This is actually in the heels of last year's budget, as all you all know, which eliminated all the state support for close to home and our juvenile delinquents and failed to fundraise the age implementation in New York City. We again need the city council, like you so well did last year, advocacy at the state on behalf of New York City youth and families. In the ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice, we have a continuum of services, including community-based alternatives for youth and their families, detention services for youth who are arrested and awaiting court resolution, and residential services throughout close to home for youth who have been adjudicated by the family court. An important part of this continuum is specially target, targeted to support family relationships in families where the parents are seeking help for the youth who is engaged in a status of fences, meaning activities that are not crimes, such as truancy, running away, and missing curfew. If these things are not addressed, these youth are at risk of homelessness and juvenile justice involvement. ACS, Family Assessment Program, work with these families through its statutory referred as Persons in Need of Supervision, PINS, providing families with diversion services and foster care for the youth when necessary. We all remember how difficult was adolescence, and it, we know that it can be complicated and often time challenging time for young people and their families. These challenges can be compounded when substance abuse, mental illness, and other complicating factors are present. Our experience with, with court involved youth in the juvenile justice system, PINs and child welfare has taught us that many of these issues that contribute to difficult youth behavior as well as more serious criminal behavior either arise or are compounded when family relationships are strained and parents feel at their wit's ends they cannot cope. Many of the interventions that ACS and DYCD offers provide youth and their parents with the tools they need to work throughout these challenges and build their relationships. Now I'm gonna get Associate Commissioner Sarah Hemmer to talk to about our community-based alternatives. Thank you. <clears throat> Overall, admissions to juvenile detention and placement, as well as foster care placements, have decreased significantly year to year because of the intensive preventive services that New York City has made available. ACS has intentionally invested in programs and services that are specifically aimed at working with youth, but that also engage the whole family unit to improve family functioning rather than merely, merely looking at the youth's behavior. The Family Assessment Program. DYFJ's Family Assessment Program, or FAP, is available to families with youth up to age 18 to help avoid involvement in the foster care and juvenile justice systems. FAP prioritizes therapeutic preventive services that help families address difficult teenage behaviors like truancy, using drugs, running away from home, and or struggles with mental illness as the best way to improve family dynamics and outcomes for youth and prevent running away and homelessness. To obtain assistance with a challenging adolescent, parents often go to the family court to file a PINS petition. Parents and guardians are looking desperately for support through court supervision, placement of their child in foster care, respite, or quick access to services. Parents who seek a PINS petition in family court are required by statute to participate in diversion services before a PINS petition can be filed. Prior to a PINS petition being filed, FAPS social workers meet with families and conduct an assessment of the caregivers and youth and determine which level of services in our continuum meets their needs. FAP serves over 5,000 families annually throughout the five boroughs and is able to prevent over 90% of parents from filing a PINS petition in court against their child. Currently, there are only approximately 104 New York City youth in foster care on PINS petitions, which demonstrates the effectiveness of our diversion programs. Again, as Deputy Commissioner Franco mentioned in the opening, all of these services are at risk in the state's proposed 2019-20 budget. ACS respectfully asked the City Council to join us in our effort to prevent these budget actions from proceeding, both so that fo the foster care system can still serve youth 
who are a danger, a danger to themselves or others, and so that the state maintains its $3 million of support for PINS diversion services. The Juvenile Justice Initiative. DYFJ also runs the Juvenile Justice Initiative, JJI, in partnership with the Department of Probation. JJI serves youth who have been adjudicated in family court and provides intensive home-based interventions to keep young people who do not need to be confined safely in the community with necessary services and supports. JJI has played a key role in reducing the city's use of residential placements in juvenile delinquency cases without compromising public safety. With Raise the Age, as we have expanded our array of preventive programs to meet the needs of older youth, and we have invested in new evidence-based programs, including multisystemic therapy, MST, EA, which will work with emerging adults who are homeless or on their own and need help to achieve independence. Among other goals, MSTEA will target housing, independent living skills, as well as education and career goals for participating adolescents. Crossover youth. The vast majority of young people in the juvenile justice system, as high as 90% regardless of gender, have experienced some sort of trauma. We know that there is a close correlation between child maltreatment and future delinquency and so we have partnered with multiple stakeholders to support children who have, who have experienced abuse and neglect with the goal of preventing their entry into the justice system. The term crossover youth describes a young person who enters the justice system while involved in the child welfare system. ACS is committed to investing in work that focuses specifically on these duly involved youth, such as the crossover youth practice model which was developed by the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at jo Georgetown University. It is a multi-agency, cross-system approach that seeks to improve outcomes for youth um, who are involved in both systems. Many of these youth are at serious risk of homelessness. They tend to be adolescents who have either a long history of child neglect and or PINS type behavior. The crossover youth practice model has brought together numerous city agencies working with, with youth to share information, collaborate on solutions, and involve the youth and their family in order to prevent further involvement in either system. Close to home. If a family court judge finds that a young person has committed an offense and at disposition finds that the youth needs rehabilitative services, the judge may order the youth to be placed in a residential placement residential placement program for a period of time, generally 12 or 18 months. Before close to home, these youth were placed in large institutions two or more hours away from their families, leading to family disengagement. Before 2011 and the enactment of close to home, many youth lingered in the system for years because of lack of permanency. Now with close to home, youth are placed in small group home, group home style residence through, throughout the city where they receive intensive and therapeutic residential programming, followed by aftercare support for the remainder of their placement period. Close to home providers encourage family visits and if needed, transport families to the residences for visitation, meetings, and other activities. The ACS Permanency and Placement Specialist, or PPS, assigned to each youth and the close to home provider work together to ensure that the youth's needs are being addressed through appropriate services both in residential placement and in the community on aftercare, creating a tighter network of supervision. The goal of close to home aftercare is to build on the skills of youth and the family and to develop a network of support that will allow them to succeed in the community. Other supports for youth and families. As a city, it is imperative that we all work to ensure that every youth has the tools needed to become successful adults and DYFJ is committed to supporting youth, families, and communities to achieve that goal. LGBTQ youth. When we talk about runaway and homeless youth and the connection to the justice system, we must acknowledge that some youth are without family support because they are not accepted for who they are and are either put out of their homes or cannot tolerate living with emotionally or physically abusive parents. Some of these youth also identify as LGBTQ. ACS has long made affirming and supporting our youth a priority. 
The evidence-based services available throughout DYFJ's continuum can often be a catalyst for family acceptance and reunification for LBGTQ youth, and we have served many of these families through FAP and JJI. We also commend our sister agency, DYCD, for dedicating significant resources and programming to meet the unique needs of these youth. For the last two years, we have been working with the Vera Institute of Justice to develop a gender responsive program that is inclusive and sensitive to the needs of our LGBTQ girls. The program will serve girls who, at who are at risk of involvement in the juvenile justice system as an alternative to, to placement or on aftercare. Services will be tailored to meet the individual needs of each girl, and we are working with providers that have experience in meeting the unique needs of our LGBTQ youth. CSEC survivors. Commercial sexual exploitation of children, or CSEC, is a form of child abuse experienced by many justice-involved youth. ACS has made supporting this population a priority, and at DYFJ, we have partnered with the Girls Education Mentoring Services, or GEMS, a, tr a nationally recognized organization that works with sexually exploited young women and girls. GEMS uses survivor leadership and transformational relationships to work with young women in our secure detention and close to home facilities to educate young people about CSEC and encourage survivors to seek help. In August 2018, Commissioner Hansel announced the launch of the New York City Child Tattoo Eradication Project, a new pilot program at ACS that provides free tattoo removal services to trafficked, gang-affiliated, and other at-risk youth in New York City. Traffic and gang-involved youth are often branded with exploiter or gang symbols. ACS has partnered with medical providers who offer pro bono tattoo removal services to youth affiliated with ACS whose brandings have hindered their ability to positively move on with their lives. We are thankful to the medical professionals who have offered pro bono services to help some of the most vulnerable children in New York City. The Family Support Center. In June of 2017, ACS opened a family support center in the South Bronx which provides a multi-service, one-stop space for youth and their families. I would like to thank Chair King and members of the Juvenile Justice Committee for visiting the center last summer and learning about the array of programs and services we offer there. As we have discussed during the, commissioner, the committee's visit, the Bronx Family Support Center houses, houses FAP, JJI, and close-to-home staff and enables families with justice system involvement to have many of their service needs met in one centralized location. However, services offered at the Bronx Family Support Center are not limited to families with justice, invo justice system involvement and are open to anyone in the community. DYFJ partners with Community Connections for Youth to provide workforce development, parenting groups, housing assistance, and education workshops. The space is designed to be shared with the whole community, welcoming everyone, including those whose children are not at risk or court involved. The Bronx location is presently the only family support center in the city, and we are planning to open a Queen Center in 2020. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss the support that ACS and our partners provide to youth and families in the community. New York City multi-agency focus of strengthening families and building competencies and support for youth is commendable and actually many times emulated by others in New York State and elsewhere and other cities across the state and the nation. Um, now, more than ever, we need the city councils to support, advocating on behalf of New York City youth to ensure that Albany does not cut our services for youth and families. We are happy now to take your questions. Thank you. Um, anyone else testifying? We're just gonna answer some questions and just have a grand old good conversation right now. All right, well, I, I thank you for your testimony today, both of you. I appreciate your communication. I'm one to always say, as we come sit at the table, how do we continue to have real conversations? Many people on the front line sacrificing their time, energy, and blood to making sure our children get better opportunities, get it right after a mess up or a, a bad, mis bad decision. Um, but it was brought to my attention, and I'm asking us as we continue to move in these conversations, as we kick into the budget session, um, Speaker, um, Speaker Johnson testified yesterday up in Albany about proposed cuts to ACS and reimbursement. I think it's appalling that 
in the day and era that we always say the two things that should be off limit when it comes to the budget is our children and our seniors, and that we think that it's okay in the, in the financial world that it's okay to cut the souls of young people trying to figure it out. Again, if we're truly saying that they are our future, then why are we trying to misstep and take away all the resources of the individuals who are trying to help our future? I don't get it. I don't understand it. So I'm asking you to stand up, make your voices heard when it comes to saving the lives of our children. Never be scared, even if you're going against the status quo or whatever agendas. The only way we get it right is to fight back. So I'm asking you all, you are at the front lines for the city of New York. Don't let anybody from the state or the federal government cut the budgets that you need to make sure that our children have the access to financial opportunities to make themselves better. So thank you for that. Um, so let's move on to a couple of questions. Um, I only have a few because I really want my, I want our colleagues uh, from both committees to, to chime in to ask you all questions. So uh, my first question in regards to all of the numbers, I just want to get an idea of how many of our young people that, that are in, the, uh, that have ran away from um, home, how many would you say that are totally that are in the system that you've been servicing? Um, how many of them that you've, you can track and say we've done a good job, that they're on the road of success, and how many have returned back that we need to continue to still help them? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer first from the juvenile justice perspective. I, and I think I, I mentioned in the opening, New York City is unique and actually one of the few places that actually, um, for many reasons, and in part of because of the support of the city council, two things. No one is discharged ever from detention without actually having a family to go to. I mean, family court judges, by practice, ensure that everyone has a go to go a place to go to before they get discharged from detention. And in the placement system, again, New York City, we close to home. We actually think exit and entry. Every young person, as you know, as social commissioner, can expand gets assigned what we call a permanency planning specialist that is working to ensure that they don't, don't just learn new skills and reduce the risk of reoffending, but also make sure there's actually a permanency resource when the person goes, goes home. Today, we open up the hearing talking about the importance of having someone in the life of the person when they go home. No one goes home from close to home without actually having at least four months of aftercare. Okay. You, you want to add to that because what all I, I thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. I was just trying to get an idea. I think, what I that think no, no, what something that I want to uh, Sorry, sorry. Uh, I mean, one thing that is important to keep in mind we should be very proud of what we do and how we do it in New York City. Most places across the nation, sadly, young people may be discharged from the institutions just with a bus ride back to the city where they came okay. from. Okay, all right, and I appreciate that. I was just trying to get on the record as well. What does that number look like of how many runaway youth have? we've helped and they've returned home or to a stable environment that they're moving forward and how many of couldn't figure it out who had to return back for additional services in our system, whether it's in the juvenile justice system or whether that's close to home or a foster care home or I'm just trying to get an idea what that number might look like. Because in your testimony, I think you said we serve like 5,000 families. So just trying to get an idea of how many have returned to st stabilization and then how many came back and needed more help? Right, so the, the family assessment program, which I think is what you're referring to, the 5,000 families that we serve, all come in with their, with their parent to seek services um, through, through the family assessment program. So they are all connected to their families, although they may have issues with whatever's happening in their, in their homes. Um, and what we try to do at the, families, at the family assessment program is strengthen those families so that the, those young people do not become homeless. Um, so so the, the, the ones that are coming to us through the family assessment program all come with a parent. Um, that's how they reach us, is the parent finds out about our services and we offer them those services to keep them together and reduce homeless, homeless service, the kids from being homeless. Um, I'm not sure we have an idea of how many kids who are homeless end up in our juvenile justice system. Um, when they are arrested and they do come to our detention facilities or too close, if they do end up in close to home, our staff, our, our case management staff and our placement and permanency specialists are outreaching to those families, whoever the family might be, um, in order to re-engage them in, in the services that we offer so that the young person has a place to be discharged to when they end their placement with us. If it happens that the 
parent remains disconnected, um, then that's when we are engaging our child welfare, the child welfare side of ACS and potentially placing them in foster care. Um, and I, we, I think I'd have to get back to you on the number of young people that, that are going into foster care after close to home placement. Um, we can get back to you with that number. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, and then before I turn it over to Councilmember Rose, um, and I'll be back with more questions. Uh, when someone does come to you um, who is a runaway, is that one of the first questions that is asked? Because we don't know they run away until they come before you. Right. So I'm just, uh, do they come? To, and if that's so, isn't that, a, are we tracking that to give us an idea from day one, from the time our first encounter with them, whether they run away or not, shouldn't we have those numbers in place so we can identify which line they go through and how they get service and how do we track their whole process in the system to the time they exit out? Yeah, I mean, so if a young person gets brought in by the police, for example, to our detention sites, we immediately do triage, you know, a certain amount of intake within an hour. But one of the things we do in our juvenile justice system, doesn't happen in the criminal justice system, is that every young person gets assigned a case manager. And that case manager actually works with the family, identifying the family resources with the courts, with the attorneys, to make sure that actually everyone is involved in the care of that kid. Most young people actually may be released on their own to probation, again, only if they have a permanency resource or family to go to, or they could be released back into close to home if they're adjudicated. Uh, it's the practice of the family court and the juvenile justice system that families are an essential voice in the court, so they're always engaged. If they don't have a family, being part of the child welfare system pro provides a unique opportunity to then find permanency resources of a different sort. But no one ever is released in New York City without having someone to go to. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, and I'm just going to ask. And I, I can get the data. I'm just going to put on the, put on the record for you. Um, it's like if you go to Olive Garden and they ask you for a survey after it, yeah. there's specific questions that they ask you that you're going to answer. So I'm just asking as we move forward, since this is a hearing trying to understand runaway youth and their involvement in the juvenile justice system, there has to be some type of mechanism to track children who are homeless mm -hmm. in the system, how they've engaged in the juvenile justice system. There has to be something. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if it's the microphones, but I'm not hearing what that looks like or what it is, so we're able to have a yeah. number. And if it's not existing, this maybe we might want to consider something different. Because remember, every young person that actually comes in touch with the juvenile justice system, we map out who, where they live, where they, who they're, they're living with, and if there's actually no one in their, in their network, which doesn't happen often, then we have to find some place to go, and the child welfare system is the place that we look into. I think you want to say something? I do. Um, in regards to DYCD's runaway and homeless youth um, system, contracted system, we, there are questions when we, our providers do intake in regards to the numbers. And I just wanted to give you some of the numbers that were relevant for fiscal year 18 in terms of youth who identified as having a juvenile or criminal history. You know, the numbers are real small because a lot of the information is self-report. But I did want to give you some um, numbers so that you can have those and then explain to you what the process is for the contracted providers in regards to assisting those youth with respect to any um, needs that they have after they identify as having a um, criminal or juvenile history. So for our crisis services until programs combined, there were only 65 youth who reported that they were either um, parole or probation. All right. Of those 65 youth, 20 have reported adult probation and 25 have reported um, juvenile probation. And of those 65, 33 reported reentry into incarceration, from incarceration. Um, and for our drop-in services, um, there were 59 youth who reported um, were either on parole or probation. And of those 59, 30 have reported adult probation and 15 have reported juvenile probation. And of those 59, 19 reported re-entering from incarceration. So what is done in um, our contracted programs is we have a, they have an extensive case management system where they have staff who are trained to work with youth on the issues that they identify during that case management session. Um, if a youth should come in and identify as having a criminal history or needing assistance with a criminal issue, then that staff creates an individual service plan with that particular youth to address that matter from either referring them to legal services, 
um, and then communicating with that legal representative so that that youth stays on track in terms of meeting the expectations of um, whatever is identified for that path to um, resolving the issue. So this is done v um, within our drop-in services as well as our residential programs, and we have both short-term and long-term residential programs. So if a youth is in one of our short-term residential programs and moves to one of our long-term residential programs, that information is, um, is mobile with the youth so that they continue to work with that youth to address the matter and resolve the matter so that they don't re-enter um, any um, you know, criminal you know, system. Okay. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Rose. Thank you. I just want to piggyback on, on, on that question. Commissioner Scott, um, were um, those numbers that you quoted, were they um, sort of gathered as a result of the um, 2018 youth count? And um, uh, as DYCD uh, recently conducted its 2019 youth count, do you believe that your improved approach, I would say, um, will show a more accurate number of RHY um, throughout the city? And what are the ways in which this count has been improved um, on the ones that were previously used? Thank you for the question. These numbers were not obtained from the um, youth count. Um, these numbers- Give me what the youth count numbers were then. The youth count numbers for for 2018, for 2018 and 2019. Were, there were 220 um, unsheltered youth. And that um, number is derived from both the HOPE count and the youth count. Okay. That the HOPE count is done by um, DSS, DHS, and the youth count is done by DYCD. So the youth uh, HOPE count is usually done that Monday. Um, and this year it was, I believe it was January 29th. Mm -hmm. And then um, the youth count is done the Tuesday to Friday after HOPE count. Okay. Mm -hmm. But and these numbers were not derived from the um, youth count. Okay. So they were, um, as a result, the numbers you quoted, Council Member King, were a, a, as a, a result of aftercare or, or the mm -hmm. social, work, social workers gleaning that information? Yes. This, um, these numbers were come from intake when intake. Um, the case management staff at the provider level, mm -hmm. um, you know, has a session with the youth and they divulge this information to them. There was some talk about the, um, the count um, not maybe um, uh, gleaning um, a, an accurate number of young people that are out there unsheltered. Did you do anything to change that, uh, the methods by which you're, you're doing your youth count now? And do you find it to be more effective than previous years? Yes, very uh, more effective. And in what terms. did you do different? Okay. Well, from the first year that we've done this, we only had seven um, sites that we um, processed the uh, youth count. To, um, from this youth count that we did this year, we are close to close to 70 sites. And we've included, um, and during the first count, we only did it at our drop-in centers and one, um, one cornerstone. To date, we do it at our drop-in centers, at our crisis services programs, in um, public schools. We do it at libraries. We do it um, street outreach-wise. So we've inc you know, grown the program to um, get to as many youth as we possibly can at many different um, locations that have been identified. What we've also done is we've um, created a group, a work group, youth count work group, that has both government agencies on it, it has advocates, it has youth, as well as others who are interested in um, youth services. Is that part and, of the ICC? This is not part of the ICC. Okay. This is separate from the ICC. This is um, done during the youth count um, approach. So it usually starts around September and ends usually in April or May um, to make sure that we have a full time to do that. We've also brought on youth count coordinators who control um, focus groups, which we have done with the Coalition for Homeless Youth. And from those systems, we've been able to create a methodology on how we're gonna do this. We've identified places where we will make sure that um, 
you know, the volunteers or the staff that go out to do the surveys know where to go in order to um, conduct the survey. We've enhanced the survey over the, um, from the first year to now to make sure that the questions that are identified are those that will get us the best answer in terms of number of youth that are homeless um, on the day of um, Hope Count. And we've also used this time to create and work with CIDI in order to get the data to present um, and attach to the Hope Count in the addendum to make sure that um, folks are aware of the numbers that are out there. And that's how we came to the 220 number from both DHS and from DYCD's perspective. And that's the 2018 or the 2019 number? The 2019 numbers haven't been done because we just ended um, 2019, so those are in process right now. The 2018 report has not been um, put out yet by CIDI, but they say they're in the process of putting that um, report out. However, they did give us the number so that we can share. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. I'm gonna let um, our colleagues, because I think we all have somewhere else to go, and I'll come back for another round. Councilman McKenna. Thank you. For the record, we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Levine from Manhattan. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rose and Councilmember King. Um, my question is that I know from the DYCD hearing that we had, and we have always continued to advocate uh, for the increase of beds for our homeless and uh, runaway youth. Um, last year, I think uh, Councilmember King, Councilmember Rose, we, we visited. Uh, one of the shelters and we talked to some of the youth and I think we were all quite impressed that they found the center and they're getting the services they need and in, in that center they also had the, the legal lawyer there and he was telling us how he actually accompanied the youth to court and make sure that they get uh, those uh, issues resolved. And so my question is that are we continue to work to increase the number of beds. Um, I know that we had a target and, and we're reaching, I hope we're reaching that target, but there's still a lot of youth um, that we've heard that don't know that these programs are available and they're still out there on the street all couch serving. Uh, so we wanted to, to see how we can continue uh, to provide the resources because these models are working. If they're working, how do we make sure that ki the kids who need the services get access to it? And we're, you know, we're willing. I mean, your testimony, you, you're talking to ask us to support working, you know, advocating with the state, and, and we would do that, but also with the administration, that we gotta continue on this track uh, to provide these services, because we know it's working. So, are there a, a target number that you, you're trying to reach or try to expand in terms of for the runaway and homeless youth? Thank you for your question. And we are in the process of um, onboarding more beds, um, especially by for under 21 by the end of um, this fiscal year. As you know, um, during with the uh, mayor's investment of 300 additional beds, that needed to be online by the end of fiscal year 19, we are in the process of doing that. We have 146 of those beds that are still waiting to be online and going through the um, state certification process. The, they have been awarded to various providers and the providers are in the process of going through the certification and getting those beds up and they're doing a great job in terms of um, making sure that that happens. So, um, we, we definitely are bringing on new beds. Currently we have 606, 607 beds that are online and the rest 147 will be online by the end of um, this fiscal year for under 21. As you know, um, we issued, we also raised uh, the age to be able to accommodate and help yeah, the, I was about to the older, <laughs> older I was about than to mention 21. that right now. <laughs> and as you know, we um, issued an RFP in August of 2018 and awarded contracts in um, October to four providers for um, residential programs for age 21 to 24. Um, and those have been awarded and the um, providers are in the process of working with OCFS, again, in terms of getting those um, sites certified so that they can, the youth can start access, accessing those sites. So with those 60 beds, um, 20 which were an investment from the Unity Project and 40 from the um, administration, that allows for a total 
of 813 beds um, for runaway and homeless youth between the ages of six, um, 753 for 16 to um, 20 and um, 60 beds for 21 to 24. I guess, do you also have um, an estimate of what's the need that's out there? Maybe we, I mean, the advocates probably uh, know, but is the administration, DYCD, do you, do you have like a, a number that you think that, that you should reach uh, because there's such a great need out there? I do not have a number that, and I hope that, that's the purpose of the youth count, is that we hope that the youth count will provide us with some type of information in regards to um, homelessness, youth homelessness in New York City, and then um, can be a driver to new needs. Um, but as you said, the advocates have been a great force in um, communicating with both with the administration um, and yourselves in regards to beds and needs and so on. Um, and that has been great in terms of us increasing from where we were. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to this administration, there was only 253 beds. So now we've added 560, which includes the, um, the um, higher age of 21 to 24. So the goal is to definitely work to get these beds that have been in invested by the administration on, on, online so that youth can access them and then identify what the new needs will be. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. I guess we will have to continue, right? Because I think Council Member Rose and I, we've been on the, the youth committee, and uh, those Council Member King too, ever since we got to the City Council. And I remember, you know, advocating for runaway and homeless youth bed for a while. And we're glad that we're seeing, you know, progress. Thank you. And, and I appreciate you going out to visit this um, programs because that's a great um, way of learning more about what the services that they provide. So if there's interest in um, seeing more programming, please let us know. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, yeah. Council Member Barron, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding the hearing and to the panel for coming to give your testimony. Um, Commissioner Franco, you sent a letter to the Juvenile Justice Committee uh, yesterday, I believe, and in it you talk about the services at Horizon as well as at Crossroads. And it seems that there are 4,860 hours of service for Horizon, but only 10% of that at Crossroads, only 432 hours of programming over a course of 26 weeks. Can you speak to why there's such a great distant difference between the two? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the letter in front of me, but actually the amount of programming between Crossroads and Horizons is equivalent. Maybe somewhere in the letter, we talk about the particular programming provided by Friends of Island Academy, right. which only focuses on adolescent offenders, which is only one living unit within Crossroads. But then all the other young people who are juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders that are in Crossroads are getting a significant amount of, of service, so actually with support from DYCD, uh, from another group called Center for Community Alternatives. But I think more than I, I think, you know, Assistant Commissioner Louis Watts, who used to be some years ago the director of Crossroads and is actually now supporting Horizons, can give you a better sense of what happens day to day to kids at Horizons and at Crossroads. Well, I'd like to get further clarification on that because it seems like the descriptions of the programs at um, Horizon are really, really great. You have All Star Working Dog, Animation Project, Autistic Noise, Artistic Noise, uh, Audio Pictures. Um, elite learners, educate to empower, mm -hmm. amplify father's love, yeah. flex, giant thinking, girl vow. The, you have about 30 programs. And then when I look at Crossroads, I see uh, about five. Yeah, but I, again, it's, it's because in the letter we are describing the programs that were brought in by Friends of Allen Academy, right. which is only serving the adolescent offenders at Crossroads. Uh, we should include and could include to you all the programs that community, uh, community Center for Community Alternatives is also providing at Crossroads. 
and that would be comparable in terms of hours and programs, and I could make that available. Okay, I, I would appreciate that. Yeah, and just to speak back, I'm sorry, how about you, Councilman? I'm well. Um, yeah, just to speak with the Crossroads, um, I would agree with uh, Deputy Commissioner Franco. Um, at Crossroads, there are a number of programs that, I have not seen the letter that you have, but there are a number of programs at, at Crossroads, including Carnegie Hall, Sprout by Design, um, the Animation Project, and the list goes on and on and on. Freedom School happens throughout uh, the summer months um, through the Children's Defense Fund. Um, so there is definitely a, a, a number of programs that keep all of our young people busy um, in both facilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, some, just a few other questions. Before a PENS filing can be accepted, families have to go through the diversion program. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I saw that there were three levels of diversion programs. Family stabilization, uh, functional family therapy, multidimensional family therapy, JJR, MST. But as I looked at them, I saw that the length of the programs varied from 21 days in a non-mandated respite for the JJR program up to four months for the other programs that were uh, identified and as little as 90 days in the family stabilization program. So if we're talking about children who really have very, very um, deep-seated needs and issues that they're addressing with and realizing that many of these issues have their roots in poverty and in uh, family trauma, which is very deep-seated, what are we doing so that beyond the four months or the five months that they're interacting with these diversion programs to sustain what it is that's needed? Right, um, so that's a good question. Um, so the programs listed there are the evidence-based programs um, that ACS contracts with. Um, and so those programs were developed um, specific and researched uh, specifically for at-risk youth and youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, they are extremely intensive programs. Um, in fact, MST, the first week you're connected with MST, a therapist is out in that home at least three times a week. They're on call 24-7 uh, for the parent if there are any crises that occur. Um, so there's, they're very intensive programs where they're working um, very holistically with the, with the youth and the family. Um, the, Part of those programs are to connect the families to other services if they need them. I saw that, but is there any follow-up beyond the time that the program is listed to provide that? Is there any follow-up with those CBOs to say, hi, how's the Johnson family doing? Are they still involved? Well, once the, so the contract provider will work with that family, it's actually three to five months is the average length of stay for those programs. Once that ends, um, they are no longer involved, but they can always come back to the family assessment program if they need additional services or some, some other assistance with any, anything and, else. Okay, so if they were to come back, would they be able then to uh, reapply or be re-involved in those programs as well? Absolutely. If, they, if necessary, yes. I, I think that's great that there's that kind of uh, ability to come back again, but when the roots of the problem are poverty yes. and uh, family, uh, deep-seated family conflict and lack of employment, until those issues are addressed, I think we're going to be just addressing the symptoms without getting to the roots. And council member, I, I think one of the things that we have learned and we need to do more of, but we began doing it in the Bronx, in the Family Support Center, we need to take a two-generation approach to solving these issues. I mean, we, we, could, we have to take a two-generation approach to, to many of these issues. So what we're doing in the Family Support Center, which we testified about, is finally not just focusing on really good evidence-based programs that help the family reunify and connect better, but also support to the parents. And that's why actually we're so eager to kind of build the relationship that we're building in the Bronx and elsewhere, where actually we have those kind of support programs, the kind of uh, coaching for parents that actually are gonna help those parents move forward. I mean, they need as, as much support as our young people need. 
Okay, uh, we, we have to still get to the root. We have to get jobs mm -hmm. for not just job training programs, but jobs. Mm -hmm. and we've got to make sure that we uh, work on our children's self-esteem, and that comes through the education system and making sure that teachers are aware of different stages of child development and address that and help children to feel good about themselves, which means understanding their cultural backgrounds and respecting that and, and elevating that. And there's a lot that we have to do beyond just uh, addressing the symptoms that are manifested. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Barron. And I would ask, while we applaud all the work that's been done with ACS, all the caseworkers, all the case managers, all the specialists, all the commissioners, the deputy commissioners, all the advocates, as Councilwoman was saying, you know, this is goes beyond this generation. It's the generation before that had a hiccup, and possibly the generation before that that was misguided. But then we have a system that's always perpetuated unfairness to certain people who are po in poverty and, and ethnicity. And once we really recognize that, then we can be fair and coming into this, coming into this house and saying, this is what we're doing. Even though we may not be doing enough, these are the issues that we get to kind of continue to focus and fight on. Because if we don't, we're like a hamster in a wheel, you know, just spinning our legs around saying we're doing something that sounds good to save, to save our titles. But then again, our children who are in these systems, the parents who have been caught and been hit with the miseducation and the misinformation and just the misdirection, we'll continue to be doing this kind of work and this song and dance when we come before one another. So while I applaud each and every one of you, I ask us to continue to be an advocate when we leave it to call the system because the system is flawed and we got to figure out how to make the system right, not defend the system, but tell the system it's wrong itself. And, and since you all are sitting in that seat, doing all you can to make sure that those children understand that we're helping out because we're working within a flawed system. Councilmember Rose. Thank you. It's always hard to follow this guy. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Wakanda forever. As RHY programs are voluntary, um, what types of educational outreach is done in terms of letting both youth who are in detention and the employees of DYFJ know their privacy rights and what they can and cannot ask about? We've heard from providers that they've noticed that sometime DYFJ will request runaway and homeless youth programs to disclose information about specific uh, runaway and homeless youth. However, this basically um, breaks their privacy um, rights and the privacy laws that are in place to protect young people. So what is done to ensure that the runaway homeless youth's rights are protected and um, can you address uh, um, what the interconnectionality, what the, the connection is between DF, um, DYFJ, whatever, all these acronyms, <laughs> and, and, uh, and runaway homeless youth providers? Do I need to say that again? I, I guess I'm, I, you know, we're, I think, puzzled because not exactly sure what you mean in terms of so confidential we've, we've information. Heard from, that we've heard from advocates where uh, a probation officer, a parole officer will call the staff or at the, um, at the residence that the runaway and homeless youth or at the till and ask are they uh, keeping curfew, are they abusing, you know, substances. Um, they will ask questions that, as a young person, no longer under your uh, care, um, now has some privacy rights because they are in a voluntary program mm -hmm. under uh, DYCD. I mean, I, I think, um, and I think I open up talking about that. It's not unusual at the national level, I'm sadly still in New York State that maybe but all officers discharge someone out of a prison with a metro, I mean, with a train ticket, and that's it. We, we are never in the position that actually someone who's discharged from the Division of Youth and Family Justice close to home or detention, where we're gonna be asking information to them about the young person. Uh, we, we don't do that. I mean, it sounds like 
you're talking about practices by other agencies? Um, we've heard from more than one advocate group okay. um, that uh, they have gotten calls you, you, uh, uh, regarding yeah. a specific um, young person that's yeah. now living in, you know, a till or a voluntary program. Yeah. And so I want to know, you know, how far is your reach um, and, you know, how you how do you address uh, again, their it, privacy it, rights? It may be that it sounds like based on what you just said, you're talking about practices by the state Department of Parole or maybe by another agency called the Department of Probation. The Department of Probation supervision of young people is not under ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice. So I don't want to respond for another So agency. no one from your system, once they're um, released from Horizons or one of your facilities, um, no one, no staff has any contact. Um, even if it's part of their aftercare um, plan? So on a aftercare are, are the juvenile del for juvenile delinquents. Uh, mm -hmm. So if the, if the court, family court, uh, places the young person in close to home, then the young person does get a period of aftercare mm -hmm. um, where, where they are in the community. Um, we are trying to, those kids are generally with their parents um, and not in DYCD's system. Um, again, if, if their parents are disengaged, uh, generally they're going to our foster care system and not DYCD's run, runaway and homeless, homeless youth system. Um, I can speak for, you know, what my staff does in terms, you know, if, if they are seeking information from another agency, mm -hmm. then consents are required in those situations. So, so if that were to happen, consents should be signed, but again, we are, Consent our kids are not going person. to the DYCD system. Commissioner Scott? And to add, for our um, programming, um, there, there needs to be a consent as well. So if, um, you know, I was from the Department of Probation or Parole or even an NYPD p police officer and I called a particular site and said, is Randy Scott um, at that residence? The residence, the staff there are not supposed to answer that question unless they get the proper um, consent from the youth to release that or some type of court order or some type of document that forces them to release that information. But that information is not shared um, out there due to the safety of um, you know, the needs of the youth because of the type of services that are provided for commercially sexually exploited um, youth, for any youth that may be in a domestic violence situation that comes to um, programming. So we do not release information um, at the disposal of someone just calling or just showing up. We do ask that they leave. Do, do any of you advise the young people of those rights? Um, and at what entry point? So when speaking from, for detention, um, they advise of those rights throughout the process, um, from the time they enter to the time they depart, right? Um, they're also advised by case management, and we also have an ombudsman uh, that's within the facility that actually advise our young people of their rights uh, while they're with us. So they are aware of their rights. And when they feel that they're wrong, they will let you know. Um, would that include NYPD, inquiries by NYPD? That includes NYPD, inquiries with, uh, uh, within NYPD as well. But it's not only the information that we're sharing with the kids, we're also sharing it with the parents when the parents come to visit as well. Mm -hmm. So this information is shared during the visiting sessions, and information is shared throughout intake as we're sitting and we're speaking to the parents. So it's a, a collaborative effort so that the young person always knows his or her rights. Same for you, Commissioner. Yes, Scott. this is the same for us um, during intake. Um, you know, there's the questions that are, um, you know, discussed with the particular youth, and again, mm -hmm. they have to go through the consents to share any information externally um, with those that may be of interested in those um, information. Mm -hmm. And um, while you have the mic, um, could you tell us just what exactly are TILS and crisis services providing in terms of skills and um, uh, in terms of skills to better equip uh, runaway youth to um, become stably housed 
and not have interactions with the juvenile justice system? Yes. Um, well, within the residential programming, con the contracted program that we have, there are usually five indicators that the uh, contracted providers need to um, work with the youth on. That includes education, employment, um, mental health, housing and basic life skills. Basic life skills could be any of the legal or immigration issues that may arise with a particular youth. Through the case management system, they work um, to address those issues. So even if it's just a matter of getting a job, do you have a, a resume, creating a resume? Have you gone through interviewing? Um, you know, so you do that type of interviewing skill. So things that will help them process to get to um, a desired outcome at the end. With respect to housing, we work with our sister agencies in order to bring in resources so that youth can um, access particular housing from supportive housing to uh, now working with um, HRA around um, City for HEPs so that they can have a voucher to help them move into um, secure housing so that they don't end up back into the system. So there are things that we currently do in terms of making sure that um, one, we have integration, we have collaboration, then two, we make sure our providers are uh, knowledgeable of what resources are available to them, even around training. We bring folks in to provide necessary training and understanding. And then three, to make sure the providers are delivering those services to the particular youth that come into their care. So you would have helped uh, Casanova get his driver's license? Yes, we would have. Yeah, and he could have gotten it. He didn't even need to go into our residential program to do that. He could have gone to one of our drop-in centers. And as you know, we have five that are 24 hours. Um, one in each borough, so he could have done it at 3 o'clock in the morning if he needed to, <laughs> even though okay. DMV would have been closed. <laughs> and anyway. um, how is this information actually disseminated? How do young people know that these services are available, how to access them? Yeah. Well, for DYCD, you know, we have a major um, social media campaign where we have an e-blast that goes out from our Youth Connect department to about 25,000 people. We also have our web websites with Instagram and Facebook, and we put it up on our website, all of this information, that they can go to any of our drop-in services to um, receive additional information, or they can call our Youth Connect hotline and to receive um, other information. And as you know, there's a, a the new um, local law that allows for additional information. So we're putting out palm cards, we're putting out flyers, we're putting things up at different locations in order for people to be aware of the services that DYCD offers. And when we do presentations, we provide um, those in attendance with information on DYCD. We have a blue book that describes all of the services because DYCD is not only RHY, we have our summer youth improvement programs, we have a workforce, we have our community development side. So we make sure that folks are, are, are very aware of what's happening within the agency um, so that they can um, access the services. Do, um, are, are, do you also utilize educational sites and transportation hubs? Um, one of the things that um, was a reoccurring story that we heard when Council Member King and Chin and I visited Covenant House mm -hmm. was that young people were out there looking for somewhere to go and um, they didn't know where to go. They didn't know how to find out where to go. They actually wound up at adult shelters that would not accept them. And those shelters in turn did not even give them the information like to call a Youth Connect hotline or, mm -hmm. or 311 or anything. And they just kind of, by, I guess, word of mouth and whatever, desperation, mm -hmm. kind of landed at Covenant House. So, mm -hmm. um, Well, for, for DYCD, we have our monthly provider meetings. So at those monthly provider meetings is where we share updated information and make sure that they're aware of what's happening. Um, we... Like I said, we try to get the message out there as much as we possibly can so that everyone is aware of the services that are available to them. The fact that we have 24-hour drop-in centers now allows for youth not to have to go to places that they may have gone before. Now they can go to a place where they can get case management. They but if they don't know staff. where that is, I mean, I really think, you know, a lot of these kids come from other places and... You know, they come through our 
Port Authority, Penn Station, uh, you know, 125th Street train station, you know, um, is there any effort to try to have that information posted somewhere? Do we need to talk to the MTA and, you know, have some sort of joint campaign or something? Yes, and, and that goes back to the local law that I was um, talking about in terms of how now we're promoting our services more through the creation of um, posters, through the creation of flyers, also through the creation of palm cards, which can be easily put into your pocket so that you can carry it around with you at all times. That gives you the access numbers um, and the locations to make sure that you know where to go at any time to receive services on any service that DYCD offers, as well as we um, are, have a great relationship with 311 so that if any youth should call that um, number, they can then ask, provide them with information um, as well. So we're looking at the many different streams that we can, um, we can access in order to get the information out. And through some of the work that's being done internally, we should have that out um, very soon and um, making sure that our providers are knowledgeable in terms of make, doing outreach in their communities. Um, so that they are aware of the services that are provided, especially in our drop-in centers. I just, I don't want to beat a dead horse, I but know, I, I just I want you to know how important this is for the safety of our young people who find themselves without a place to be. Um, they need a safe refuge and so that they don't have to depend on survivor skills Correct. and um, wind up in, um, in detention or in, in the criminal justice system just because they're trying to get a place to stay or to eat yep. or someone decides to make them a sex trafficking victim yep. in order for them to have you know, a, a domicile. So I, I just think it's really, really important and I, I just keep thinking about a young man that came from Philadelphia. You know, he, he passed through you know, our major transportation hubs and you know, for days he was all over the place, and you know, adult uh, shelter and things like that. So I, I just want us to, because it's great to have a card, but you gotta know where to get the card. You gotta figure out where to get that information. So I, I just and think we need to be much more visible. Yeah, and, and um, to add that we, we're also working with our sister aid. We, we now have a relationship with DOE to make sure the information is spread there. Mm -hmm. We're working with DOHMH to make sure information is spread throughout their agency and their um, pro providers that they work with. So we are definitely making sure that the information is not mm -hmm. just kept internal at DYCD, but it's spread across the entire city at the, all of the different agencies so they are aware of mm -hmm. runaway and homeless youth services because you know not many people even know that there is right. a division for that right. at DYCD so we are making sure we put forth the best um, effort to make that information available so I, I thank you I just you know I just want you to know we, you have to have the information where the kids are you know not where we are but where the, the, the young people are Councilmember King I want to just jump in and kind of, I don't want to use the term piggyback, um, but just stay consistent with what she was sharing with us. I'll never forget a time about 20 years ago, someone says, uh, just send it to me on Gmail. I had no idea what Gmail was. So even though I was in my adult years, I wasn't on the internet, I wasn't using the emails. So when our world says we are here, we have to talk and we know as as we work with children, you have to meet children where they are and have that type of system that communicates with them. So while we may know what access points of so how to where we people need to go, everyone doesn't know the access. Casanova clearly made it clear to us today, no one even taught him what it is to take taxes out of a check. No one taught him how to go get an ID card. So we can't sit up here and say, well, I posted it here and then expect a 14 year old who's lost who's running from a traumatic, traumatic situation to know our system. So how, do, how, are, we, how, do we, how are we better in having that communication? Again, not having a communication for the, you know, you, you know the term, don't, don't write for the reader. You know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta write, you can't speak to the writer, you gotta speak to the reader. 
So that means our, our conversation and our plans have to change. So if we have an idea that teens are coming through our hubs, they got to be that, you know, you know, like you, you walk in that first Geico commercial, that, that big banner that's up there. Well, why can't you have, we walk in and it's, you know, if you are just entering the city, you're homeless or you're a runaway or you got a challenge, just call this number. Whether it's at 42nd Street or 125th Street or 34th Street. How, at, the question then goes, how are we reaching young people who are out there? Because as I looked at the numbers here, which you all did not, and I'm not, I don't mean to put you on blast, but in 2008, there was over 3,600 runaway use. It would dwindle down. According to 2008, New York City survey determined that there was 38 runaway youths. So um, 38,000 runaway youths. Today, um, the city is estimating 1,600 spent the night. But in 2019, we can't figure out what that number looks like. I didn't hear that. That's what I was trying to get from the start. It's because so when you figure out what your number is, then you can figure out where you are, who you're looking to serve, and where do we go to reach to, to see who, who's who. According to, your, according to the, 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 the report here, we also know that 90% of the brothers that are in there, 90% 90, 90 of your runaways are people of color. So how, how does that have an impact in your communication and your outreach, and where do we go with those numbers now that we know that those are numbers, and is this a real number? And if it is, we got a bigger problem. Again, I'm sorry, I want to apologize. Earlier I said that the system is flawed. No, the system isn't flawed. The system is doing exactly what the system was designed to do. We just got to help the young people understand that they're living in a flawed society that's doing what it's supposed to do, that they're not getting it right. So what do we do in that system to understand, to change, to have a paradigm shift to save these souls? That's my question. It goes back. How is the system doing the better case of outreach and knowing the numbers so we know who we serve in, how do we serve, and what is our messaging to say this works and it doesn't work because of a 26-year-old man can come, 27-year-old man can come in and say, I didn't know and I've been in your system for eight years. What relationships are we having with the adult system and the youth, youth, the juvenile system? Because he came in, they come in at 14, but still at 27, no one educated enough, even though you just said, well, he could have did this, he could have that, but someone inside. So my question, the second question goes to, how are y'all working with the adult systems? Because if the 14-year-old we met who came from Philadelphia, comes to New York, goes to an adult shelter, and the adult shelter acts like they don't have a clue. That's scary. They, that's scary that the adult system, so <laughs> the, that next question is, how are you working with the adult system that everyone has the same inf information, whether you're 14 or 28? Well, in regards to one thing I wanted to add to what I was saying before is that we also have a street outreach team. And our street outreach team canvassed the New York City area, engaging youth at many different locations in order to make sure that they have the necessary resources and information. So that's one way that we continue to do that on a nightly basis in terms of the youth that we encounter. What are the hours? The hour, currently, the hours for um, street outreach are 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Right. And with respect to um, conversations with the adult system, we. we have worked with our sister agency, um, DHS, on many issues in terms of making sure that they have knowledge of our system, even giving them access to our available um, beds so that they can make the necessary referral to the bed. We provided training to them, um, and meaning their staff at their different um, intake centers so that they know how to access our system and communicate with us on a um, daily basis and if they should come into contact with youth that may fall within our um, age um, criteria. So. We, we, we continue to work with them. We continue to um, make sure that they have the updated information so that they can work with any youth that come into their care that might be um, best um, suited for our system. Can I just ask you, um, VRC, they work with the homeless population. They're out at night, you know, uh, trying to get homeless people shelter. Um, would you, work with an agency like that, uh, a not-for-profit that's, um, that's not funded by DYCD, that's not a, a, a city agency, but is out there um, who encounter young people, who might encounter young people out there? VRC, I believe, is um, funded by DHS, and what we've done is I've uh, myself gone out to speak to their outreach teams. 
and I provided them with the necessary information and contact numbers so that if they should come into um, contact with the youth, they know how to navigate um, our system so that they can um, transport a youth to our respective site. So they um, definitely are aware, and um, I've done actually two trainings to their outreach um, programming, and I did BRC most recently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council member, I have one more question. Um, um, uh, what conversations are being had by DYCD with uh, runaway and homeless youth providers in terms of raise the age? Are there funding concerns in regards to DYCD and its runaway and homeless youth providers as a result of the implementation of raise the age? You want to <laughs> <laughs> the, the <laughs> and and the, to clarify, are you asking about raise the age on the DYCD side to older to than 20? Yes. To, yeah. Excuse me? To the 21 to 24 years. Yes, old. yes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, well, actually, they're very excited With about the providers. Yes. The, the conversations you're having. At our provider meetings that we have on a monthly basis, we definitely talk about the, um, the new age in terms mm -hmm. of 21 to 24 and getting those beds online. Um, so they're very excited about the fact that they're, we're now branching into um, new residential um, type of programming. So we now have to wait for these programs to come online so that we can see how the impact that um, it may cause, and we hope to have that up soon. We, we're working with the state as well as um, you know, the Department of Buildings and the FDNY, because you know with um, buildings you have to make sure that they're safe for youth mm -hmm. to, um, residing or anyone to reside in. So we're going through that process of, for certification. And once we have those sites up, then I'll be able to um, share more information with you. So um, the 60 beds that are going to be certified this year, right? There's 60? Well, they're going through certification going currently through right now, now with right. the state. Mm -hmm. And um, the state has its, its process that they have to um, go through in order before they can give a certification to mm -hmm. a program. Mm -hmm. So we're working within that, um, mm -hmm. that system right now. And um, we have enough capacity to to absorb those 60 beds right away, right? At In terms of youth being yes. um, able to access those programs, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the providers will definitely say that they can, um, all, any youth that are aging out can go into those programs. Um, it's 60 beds, so I feel that we, sh we should be able to fill those beds once they're online. Do you have any funding concerns with uh, needs in terms of raise the age and being I, able I, to provide the services? I would have to go back and get that, um, speak to my upper management in terms of any concerns that may arise. Okay, mm -hmm. the budget hearing's coming up yes. soon. It's in and March, I'm right? gonna expect an answer. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you, council member. Um, we wanna thank you today for today's testimony and I just asked us to continue to look at our numbers, find out our bottom lines, and really look at the root of everything. You know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a kind of guy, you know, I say, hey, listen, if you really want to resolve an issue, you got to go straight to the core. And you cannot cure uh, a venereal disease with Tylenol. So we can't have the Tylenol conversation where we know we need to get some, per we need real penicillin to solve a problem. So I'm asking us to do that, and, uh, and then when we get back, because you actually said budgets coming across, we really need to know what the numbers look like because how, what is your capacity in your system to handle the number of young people that might be homeless, that are all homeless? But if we don't know what you're working with now or what your capacity could possibly be, how do we manage the dollar amount to help you serve our young people and, and whatever that gender looks like to help them you know, pull themselves uh, out of their scenario and being one day sitting on that side with a suit and tie and testimony and having a testimony with us because they're a commissioner or a deputy commissioner or whatever that looks like. So I want to thank you again. We got a couple of advocates, other folks who want to share their, their stories. So thank you again for your conversation. We look forward to continuing. God bless. Thank you. Commissioner Scott, can we have an offline conversation? Uh, um, I want to call up to the next panel, uh, advocate Griselle Crew. Um, I'm sorry, I don't read shorthand very well, so forgive me. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yes, exalt. Come on, sister. <laughs> I'm exalt. <laughs> mm. 
you our, our advocate. Oh, they did. Oh, 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 she's the last one. She's the last one. Oh, well, you are the sole survivor, and you are <laughs> winner, winner. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yes, you may. Go for it. So I'm just asking you to just say your name for the record so we have a and introduce your team that's with you as well. And then you will have, well, since you are the last person to speak, you get four minutes to share your, whatever you want to share with us. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Giselle Castro from Exalt Youth, the executive director, and with me, good afternoon. Uh, and with me is our deputy director, Brian Lewis. Good afternoon. So because we're the only ones, and I believe that people are familiar with our organization, I'll just give a very brief synopsis and more specifically the work that we have been able to do with young people who have been impacted by the juvenile justice system and then also impacted by homelessness. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Thank you. We are Exalt Youth. Good afternoon. And we have been in existence for over 12 years, but we are a spinoff from CASES, one of the oldest alternative to incarceration program. And overall, our model has been able to show that we have been able to work very well with young people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. So we focus on three particular areas, which is educational progression, ensuring that young people move out of the criminal justice system and employability. Um, overall, what we heard today was the impact that most of our young people who are both impacted by the system but poverty are challenged by um, homelessness. And we know from the last report, the data count, I'm sorry that I'm not following the, um, um, the script, but I think that what, since we're the only groups here, would like to, you know, just to capture um, the work that we have been able to do with our youth, particularly those who are our most vulnerable. You know, the last data in 2017 begins to show that about 7,000 young people have been impacted by homelessness. With our youth, we serve young people ages 15 to 19, and we're growing to essentially serve more young people throughout the five boroughs. Um, Exol has been in existence, and we have tested a model that literally begins to show that two years out of graduation, 8% of our young people are not reconvicted of a crime, and that's significant. 95% of our young people are, going, are graduating from high school, but we're seeing a growing body of youth who are going off to college. And then um, our internship model, we have been able to engage youth in some of the best places. We've had many of our youth testify in front of city council because they intern with, um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking out the name. Innocence Project, the Children Defense Fund. Um, so I just want to, you know, close here because I, I've never had Brian Lewis, you know, with me um, to testify, but he has been the one who's working very closely with the teachers, with the program coordinators. We're growing, we're scaling the organization to serve more young people. We've made a commitment, um, you know, a very long time ago to ensure that we assist with uh, the many young people who are unfortunately, you know, still struggling in both um, two areas, academically and deeply involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, yes, and I'd just like to reiterate, as the artist who was with us earlier, Casanova, mentioned, and also as um, Andy King has mentioned as well, incarceration is one of the root causes of homelessness and for instability in housing for our youth. And so uh, we are not a housing organization. Um, however, we do find that many of our young people, through the course of their participation with us, lose their housing or encounter unstable housing. And our model has an answer for that because we're providing young people with skills, we're providing them with paid internship opportunities. We are helping them to understand how to navigate the nuances and complexities that exist between the incarceration system and the outside world. And we're really preparing them for 
a life of success, opportunities, and freedom by speaking to them at their level from a place that they can understand. At Exalt, we utilize critical pedagogy, which is Paulo Freire's methods of engagement um, to capture youth where they are so that they can pursue freedom and understand the connections between education and freedom. Thank you. We'll let you Thank ramp you. up. Thank you. Um, no, I, I think that uh, we wanted, you know, just to capture um, in terms of as an organization, you know, that we really are here for our young people, New Yorkers, particularly. You know, we have, as I said before, a real tested model. Um, you know, we have been for the past few years collaborating with other nonprofit organizations. You know, one thing that I want to highlight, you know, about what our organization and the work that we're doing in particularly Brooklyn, we have been able to have judges and DA reduce sentencing, you know, from felony charges to a misdemeanor or vacating. This is significant because when we talk about the cycle of poverty, we do know that if a young person is convicted of a crime, and we've heard this so many times, you know, young people are not able to find and gain employment. They're not able to access um, housing. Um, you know, so we are doing something, you know, very, not necessarily different, but I would say it's the courage, you know, to ensure that we're advocating correctly. Um, we're coming into Manhattan. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting with your office, um, um, I think on Friday, and we're serving more young people coming in from Staten Island. Uh, we've met with the judges, all of them that have been um, newly appointed um, by the youth part. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a significant time in New York, and as you know, the chair has been highlighting, there's still a lot of challenges. Uh, but we have been in existence for quite some time, you know, addressing um, the two, I would say, most critical areas for our young people, which is education, criminal justice. Employment is employment, but we know that that's a journey, you know, for our youth. And we have a pretty good, strong model that begins to show that we have, you know, good results. So thank you for this afternoon for allowing us to speak on our program and the work that we plan to do. Well, forward. thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And what is it that you think that, what is it that you're doing right that the system is doing wrong, you know? And is there some way to, to connect so that the same type of culturally competent services mm -hmm. that you're delivering and the results that you're getting you know, translate, you know, for system-wide, mm -hmm. because um, your, your graduation, your retention numbers are very impressive, mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't see that same kind of number on the, on the you know, on the city side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, since we're trying to prevent mm -hmm. homelessness, we're trying to prevent recidivism, and you seem to have been able to master that. What is it that you're doing right or that you're doing differently? Um, and can, it, can we sort of connect the dots here so that we, you know, we're able to make a difference in a lot of young mm -hmm. people's lives, Absolutely. all young people? Absolutely, and that's a great question. It's the one that we're always asking, testing, um, we have been evaluated, you know, by the Annie E. Casey, by John Jay, uh, by independent, um, you know, consultants at this point, NYU. And there's a few things. One is our curriculum. You know, when we say that we're culturally relevant, um, it is, you know, cultural relevancy. You know, we are one of the few organizations that really address mass incarceration um, head on with our youth. The school to prison pipeline, I mean, that's our adult language. You know, our young people, they live the school to prison pipeline. Um, you know, racism in this country as well. And the real challenge that a young person will have to make significant progress academically, unfortunately, they're the ones being received by um, the police officer. So what we have been able to do is like really bring language to the challenges that a young person is facing even before we prepare them for the world of work. Um, and that's one thing that we have been able to see that um, creates a lot of success. We also wanna bring the passion of learning back. I mean, our young people, we know this, they test at the sixth, sixth grade reading level, uh, but our staffing model becomes really, really important. We want our young people to come in and feel excited about learning. 
Um, if you come into our office, which I have invited you, we have no rules. We set a tone. And I think that at the core tenant, you know, what we're saying is that we humanize our youth. Um, there, are, I think that, you know, some of the things that we do bring to um, the table, it is real relationship. You know, when I think about the results that we gain with judges and with the DAs who are elected, appointed, you know, officials, that is beyond trust. You know, we have our mechanisms. We have the way that we, you know, communicate the challenges that a young person has. But essentially, you know, we're sh highlighting and we follow the stages of change, um, you know, methodology, which is our, a relapse is not a relapse. It is that something happened. Um, so some of the things that we could provide is, you know, technical, you know, assistance. Uh, we do follow the, I would say, the youth development principle, which we all do, but it is that a, a loving, caring adult navigates a young person, but that adult needs to understand that the, a young person is facing a lot of significant challenges. And I do appreciate, you know, what you said, you know, Andy, which is a lot of times, you know, we come up with language, our kids are saying something else. We're always getting their input. Um, the other thing, and I could go on and on, like in terms of onboarding, we also have, um, you know, some of the educators from Bank Street College, and Barney could probably talk a lot about this adult development. There's something that happens to us. Every year that passes, we have changed as an adult, um, but our young people, they're still 14 and 15. So there's a lot of rigor in the organization, and I think that that is something that it's very important, is giving um, people who are staff um, the opportunity to really learn, to really assess what is happening in the landscape, um, and then also giving an opportunity, you know, to um, establish stronger relationship across the board. I don't know if you want to add. I think I'm sure you yeah. do. Well, and that's exactly right. And we're happy to provide technical assistance and training because we oftentimes within institutions are dehumanizing our youth and our young people. That happens in the legal institutions, that happens in the educational institutions in our society. And even for those of us who are well-educated and well-trained, no. we've received training and education that perpetuates that dehumanization. So I have a master's in education, but the kind of training that we're providing to our staff is wholly different. It's really about unlearning a lot of the things that the system has taught us to do to perpetuate dehumanization for our young people. So it's very unique what we do, and, and we're happy to work with our partners and collaborate to, to spread that and, and show how that works. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony today and your conversation. My last question, are, um, are you working with the city? If the city has, has given you a contract, are you part of ACS? Are you part of anybody? Are you just a standalone CBO trying to, you know, when people trickle out, you're there to hold a flag, say, come with me, or how is, are you, what's going on? So what's going on, that's, a, that's, a, that's another great question. For many years, this was our financial model. We wanted to... Um, you know, study and test and examine our organization, and we did that for over 11 years. So we've never pursued any, you know, government funding. Um, and now we are in a place where um, we are looking for real partnerships. So in terms of ACS, we are interested in supporting the work that they're doing. The same thing is true with DYCD. Um, and then obviously, you know, we're here because this is the, I mean, I've been in the field for many years, like for over 20 years, and when I think through um, the amount of people who are really pushing for change, you know, the organization is right, you know, to partner. Um, so we no longer want to be the standalone, you know, CBO. We really feel, um, I'm going to call it an obligation to then share what we know. Uh, one thing that we have done is that we stayed in our lane, you know, for many years. You know, this is where we've tested this one, you know, particular area. We have a lot of rigor. So we're not going to say that we're expert on many things, but the one thing that we are is the two areas is moving young people away from the criminal justice system and ensuring that they do as best as they can academically. So I welcome the opportunity you know, to partner with um, you know, city agencies. Okay. Well, we thank you. We thank you for your energy. We thank you for your effort, and thank you for being part of the solution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy and be safe. With all there. that being said, I don't see any others to, who are willing to share their story, so we want to thank you. I thank Councilwoman Rose, the staff here, Josh Kingley, and Paul Senegal uh, for today's conversation. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned.